Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to enjoy meeting Kathy Ross. We're very lucky to have her with us today. She's a wonderful artist, and she has a show at uh, Bainbridge right now. It's up all April, May, and it'll stay up until June 2nd. So if you can get over there, please do. Museum is free to everybody. And on, on your way out, there's a little bowl with a piece of paper in it that has all of Kathy's website information if you want to click on how to <coughs> find out more about her. Kathy was born in a small apple orchard in southern Ontario, Canada, a few years ago. <laughs> Lots. <laughs> and she's been doing art ever since. Uh, ever since she, w she was 18 years old when she picked up a nail file and carved a piece of soap. And I think her mom was her first fan. She said, that is a good head. <laughs> and she's done every kind of medium since. Beads, ceramic, tin, dolls. She sold rag dolls at Pike Place Market many years ago. They were very popular. She's done everything in the world that you can do in the world of art and supported herself since 1978 as an artist, which is not easy to do in this world of art, which can be dominated by white men and can often neglect women artists, queer artists, people of color, or outside artists. We're not sure if she's an outside artist, because we don't know what that means. <laughs> but she does sleep outside in a tent. So I think that qualifies her. So here is Kathy Ross. Thanks, Ellen. Is the sound OK? Oh, good. Well. Do you know why artists are the easiest people in the world to talk to? All you have to do is say to them, so, what are you working on? <laughs> and their eyes light up, you know, which is virtually what Horizon House did, inviting me to do this art talk. So thank you for making it happen, Ellen. And thank you for coming to hear me go on about art, or whatever you want to call it. Call it creative process. Let's see now. So, who's got the card that says 11 on it? Microphone, please. Ah. Just a minute. Technical issues. Hasn't anybody ever told you less is more? <laughs> now, sometimes people try to tell me that less is more, and maybe it is. But if you haven't seen my show, if you have seen my show at Bainbridge Island Museum of Art yet, I think you'll agree that I will probably never be one of those less is more types. My arty uh, great nephew, James, says, you should be always asking, what could this piece do without? What could I take away? Probably really insightful. But I'm always saying, gee, what else could I put on this piece? But I'm actually a minimalist in a lot of ways. You would look at my house and say, whoa, really? What a total wreck. But then you would spend a little time there and realize, yes, there is a couch but no place else to sit. I don't have very many dishes or towels. My clothes are mostly covered with glue and plaster and have holes burned in them. I don't need a dining room. I need studio space. And I sleep outside. Why waste perfectly good studio space on a bedroom? S see, the functional part of my life is minimalist, right? The art part is all chaos, and I don't like to mix up those two areas, which is why I don't like to make functional art. 
It's all about chaos management. Plus, I think there's plenty of functional stuff in the world already, and I like making stuff that looks functional, but actually isn't. <laughs> see, see art, art is like my whole life. It's like my skin. It's all I ever do. It's my clothes. It's the answer to every question, every doubt. For instance, having a bad day? The world is horrifying? Make art about it, obviously. See, I'm sort of a hoarder and sort of a minimalist. And I'm introverted and also extroverted. I love solitude, but I'm not hyper-private. I love detail, but I'm not meticulous. I love, tre I love trees. I hate helicopters. I insist on freedom, and I insist on social responsibility. I break rules, but I honor agreements. I love being alive, and I'm looking forward to being dead. <laughs> this is not the world I want to be alive in, and this is exactly the world I want to be alive in. Now, who's got the card that says 12? I've heard you describe your work as over the top and under the surface. What do you mean that, by that? Well, thank you for asking that question. <laughs> so on the surface, my art looks pretty detailed, even decorative, even cute sometimes. The essence of over the top. So that's on the outside. And that's far enough in for a lot of people. And really, I do make some art that dead ends right below the surface. But my favorite work doesn't stop there. Usually, there's a lot of hidden detail, secret compartments, backstory. Then I might lose people at the blood and guts level way in there. Anyway, unless you're paying attention, you might not notice the undercurrents, though hidden in plain sight, swimming through a sea of detail. Oh, who's got number 33? Hmm. Here comes the microphone. Oh, OK. Where do your art ideas come from? Hmm, interesting question. Yes. Well, introspection, looking around, noticing stuff, combining stuff. It gets to be a habit. It's like I'm always fishing, and the hook is always baited. For instance, uh, at the, um, oh, geez. At the Nifty Thrifty in Shelton, one of the employees showed me this toaster. And she said, I bet you could use this. And I thought I probably could. But it wasn't until a couple of weeks later I noticed that, ah. I'm sorry, I have to do two things at once here. Ta-da! So, uh, so a couple of weeks later, I thought, toast and jam. So this is called toast and jam. See, that's, that says, uh, is the world toast? You see the, the fire and flood, right? And then on the other side, great toaster, huh? Fabulous, isn't it? Anyway. On the other side, it says, fossil fuel jam. See, ideas come from other ideas. It's like I'm weaving together strands of ideas. Uh, sorry. Wait. Oh, there. Ha. Ha. Who's got? No, nobody. Nobody needs to have a thing. I've got it myself. <laughs> <laughs> and for instance, in a church in Oaxaca, Mexico, I saw this amazing relief sculpture of a tree. See that picture on the left? That's more or less that one. All the branches ending in torsos of saints. And I love that morphing of people and trees. I'd sort of like to morph into a tree myself. Which is, I guess, where I got the idea to put reading people on the branches of my tree. Uh, who's got a card that says number 45 in it? I 
How was it constructed? Oh, thank you for asking that. I bet people are curious. So I stiffen cloth with plaster and drape it over the armature, which is the structure, you know. Huge, huge, enormous mess, plaster. Then paper mache it all with maps, then glue beads, etc. And then, of course, the trunk comes in four pieces. All the torsos are separate pieces, too. Now, I'm not an engineering wizard, but I'm innovative, and I know enough not to make something so big I can't get it out of the studio door. I learned that the hard way. And by the way, notice that uh, they're all reading books. Uh, the book pages are from a cut-up tree identification book. Now, who has got the tag that says time? Hmm. Here comes your microphone. How long did it take? <laughs> 75 years. Actually, this is the most common question I ever get. I don't think painters get this question. Odd, isn't it? Now, this tree might have taken a couple of months, but what does that question really mean? Do you count design time, the time scrounging around for materials, the time put into making mistakes, the time waiting for glue to dry, the time put into marketing or exhibiting? This tree is part of a series I call No One is an Island. It includes the trees, globes, clouds, islands. The undercurrent behind this is that tension between wanting to feel separate from the world and also wanting to feel connected. Now, this video I'm showing you next is from a show at Green River Community College. Ha. Mm. That, that I did last year called uh, No One Is An Island or Tinscapes. Ta-da! This is from my artist statement. Sometimes I wonder if the world is surprised at where human evolution has led. Who would have thought that something as beautiful and brilliant as human beings could turn against the very ingredients of our own existence? Each of us has borrowed a set of molecules from the universe's available supply, and we will need to give it all back one of these days, like returning a book to the library. So how do we manage to see ourselves as not part of the world? We're all made out of exactly the same stuff. We aren't um, all that different from trees. Spring marks a new beginning. It's an opportunity to start over and embrace Whoops. hope for a bright future. Iranians have a word for it. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, so, I would have loved this tree when I was a kid. Sometimes I think what I make is basically toys, like I'm trying to please a six-year-old part of myself. There's, there's things go around on this. This, this is the detail on the tree. There's lights and tunnels and music boxes. There's a fisheye lens for an iPad in there. So who's got the uh, note that says tree? There you are. See, I was having a hard time sketching this out initially. So I finally closed my eyes when I was making the tree, and I went like this. Hmm. Mm, 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 mm. And then when I opened my eyes, it was like I could see it. It was like air, what we call air sketching, which really, why does that work? But it does. I see I could still see it when I opened my eyes. So. What is this tree made out of? Ah, just a minute. <laughs> Cookie tins, tea tins, lunch boxes. Sometimes I use roof flashing. It's a copper foiling process that... Um, they use on stained glass, like they use on stained glass. Hmm. So I cut up, whoops, oh dear. 
doesn't quite want to run this one. There we go. Thanks. So, so I cut up pieces of tin, then put on copper tape, flux, and solder. And then I have pieces I can solder together and turn it into a three-dimensional thing. It's very hot, extremely hot. So I always, that's how I always burn my clothes, burn my fingertips. But there's something so neat about the way it melts. Just a minute. Okay. <laughs> this is a big Im important part of working with tin, obviously. <laughs> uh, who's got a who's got a note that says dragons? Do you ever make dragons? <laughs> oh, funny you should ask that. Because as it happens, I do. Now, you might notice the propellers on this dragon. That's because it's partly an airplane. It's a combination of a dragon and a bomber, which drops not bombs, but toys and books and food on the bomb site, which is the archipelago, which would be set up below. You c this is at, at Bainbridge Island Museum of Art right now. So it's a more humane kind of bomb to drop, don't you think? It would work out better all the way around. It's even a compromise because it gives a little something for the guys who were just dying to bomb something because obviously it could have been cluster bombs. It would make you look just as tough, but also as if you had a heart. And you wouldn't end up pissing off the broken-hearted people whose children just got blown up. I don't see why nobody ever thinks of this. Now, who's got a card that says world? Do you ever make globes? How did you know I love globes? Somebody gave me a globe once for a birthday when I was a kid. I loved it so much. I used to set my globe and my doll, Jimmy, on the chair by the window to take with me in case of fire. I was very scared of fire when I was a kid. Still am, really. The farmhouse where I grew up caught fire several times. The back steps, a hot plate in the bedroom, a towel over a heater in the bathroom, the entire kitchen. Then later, a house fire in 2006. A forest fire in 2014 sometimes feels like it's the whole world. I've been making globes for as long as I've made art. There are some earlier soft sculpture ones, but this, one, this set is from 35 years ago, an installation at um, Stonington Gallery in Seattle. The floor underneath, you can see, is covered with the same stuff that embellished the globes, as if it had all been blasted out when the worlds fell apart. Now, if you were to take a globe and cut out the oceans, you'd be left with a handful of continents, like a regular cardboard globe, you know? But the oceans are still attached to each other, so I cut out the continents instead. Which might make you kind of wonder. Like, when I was a kid, everybody said, the world is round. OK, I thought. But I thought it was round like a plate, not round like a orange. But then, what is on the inside? Is it all like a big ball of water, and the continents are like boats floating and teetering around on the surface? And wouldn't that mean that if you waded out too far from the shore, you would fall over a drop-off and maybe get sucked in under the land? But actually, the world is pretty much solid inside. The oceans are like a big interconnected puddle sloshing around on the surface of whatever the inside middle is made out of. Now, Picasso was known to say, 
I put into my pictures everything I love. I would add to that, I put into my art everything I fear, like fire, like war. They're negotiating world peace in there. There are two gun-headed baby dolls and two dove-headed baby dolls sitting around a table. And the crystal ball in the middle is a clear marble lit up from underneath. But sometimes it really isn't a backstory. It's just plain, unserious fun. Now, who has a card that says music? Do you ever make anything having to do with music? Ah, coincidentally. Yes, I do. This is from a series called Musical Chairs with Enough Chairs. <laughs> See, even extra chairs. The book and video are from an installation I put up at Anacortes a couple of years ago. Here comes a video. Bear with me. Oops, yeah. In the traditional version of musical chairs, the music pauses and ten littles scramble for a place to sit, but only nine chairs. So one of the smalls is left standing. The bigs then remove another chair. The music starts up and the nine smalls mill around nervously. Then the music stops and another is unable to find a seat. This continues until the most agile and aggressive among them claims the last chair and wins. The littles won't be putting up with this indefinitely. Sooner or later, they will ask, who made up this story? Why aren't there enough chairs? Eventually, because this is how the game is played, won't be a good enough answer for anybody anymore. In my version of musical chairs, there are enough for everybody, extra chairs for even for the smallest, slowest, most mild-mannered of us. The question is, if there are really not enough chairs to go around, how do we want to deal with this? By forcing the smallest to fight each other for a seat at the table? Notice the bigs seem to have enough chairs. Do we like to live in a world in which the littles don't? I set up the turntables and ragtime music on a timer so that there are short pauses regularly, just as in the game of musical chairs, but not so mean. And this is, uh, this is about social justice in general, not just enough chairs, but enough food, shelter, health care, enough cake. And, just a minute. And enough hats. <laughs> Sorry, that took so long to get there. <laughs> I, I started making hats. Oh, by the way, who's got the card that says hat? Hold on a minute. Would you bring him a microphone? I started making hats just to be silly and make myself laugh. And then I thought of how it works into the musical chairs series. I like to hook up different projects in together. So what is, the, what is that? What is on your Can you wear the hats? Ah, only sort of. Um, remember, I don't like really, really like making functional stuff. Anyway, the hats and hairdos are designed to be worn, but only for long enough for you to take a selfie. They're really heavy and uncomfortable. The models are happy to put them on, and a few minutes later, even happier to take them off. Now, you notice I worked in a globe. I always work in globes when I can. Plus, I've always liked those pink flamingos. I never pass one by in a thrift store, but I do not take them from people's lawns. <laughs> I made some hairdos, too. Uh, on the right, that used to be a kid's ruffled skirt. Upside down, right? Plaster, da da I really love ruffles, though I wouldn't be caught dead actually wearing them. Then I made a hat for two people. 
Where are my, do I have some volunteers to try the, to, oh yes, please, come up here. So, which is, this one is really hard to wear. Stand right in front of the, of my table here. How's that? Terrible, isn't it? <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, yes. And then since I seem to be uh, into wake making unwearable costumery, I applied that to my Shut Up series, too. Now, this is a Shut Up outfit. You can't sit in it, really. You can't wear it, but you can stand behind it and have your picture taken. It's also an extra chair for the musical chair series, too, as in Enough Quiet. Um, oh, and also, and would you come and put on this? Uh, there's an outfit, too. This is, this is another wearable. Uh, this is a shut up hat. Okay. Can you see it very well? Let's see, do I need to be a little lower? Okay. Annie, and this is the, and then there's a shut up outfit that Anne is going to model. Come here, <laughs> right over here. Grab it this way. No. Nope. Oh, okay, yeah. All right. Hold it. Yes. And there's a few more of these. <laughs> and walk right across the room and come back with it. <laughs> now, who's got the note that says shut up? Can you, you know, can you talk loudly? Suspense. What is this shut up thing all about? Did you... Okay, well, well, actually, nobody seems to know this, but the soundscape is a commons, like air, like water. You can't just, you can't just dump mercury into the river. So can't we have some agreements about noise pollution too? Once in a while, couldn't we just have a day off, helicopters, leaf blowers, trucks, dirt bikes, lawnmowers, planes, target practice. When did we actually sign off on all this? I'm going to write shut up on my roof in huge letters. Just push it farther along. Here, put it down. So loud. I know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I like to get up before dawn, so I can sit in my thinking spot in the woods for a couple of hours while the planes and helicopters are still at home in their pajamas, eating their Cheerios and drinking coffee to rev themselves up for the day's noisy infringements. Oh, now who has the card that says quiet? Okay, here comes the microphone. Couldn't you just say, please be quiet? Don't you think shut up is kind of rude? <laughs> well, noise is rude, too. <laughs> but it's even ruder than you think. Now, plug your ears if you don't want to hear what is generally thought of as a bad word. And Anne and Carol, pick up the, we have a, stand up, please, and show those. If you don't really don't want to hear this thing, hold up your hand, and my assistants will bring it to you. OK? All right, then. I prepared you. Some of the text says, shut the fuck up. But I made little asterisk pieces so that I could put over the fuck in case I want to show this in a place where people are more tender hearted than the sum of this group is. <laughs> now, weirdly, I've started really liking these loud toys, the trucks and helicopters and vintage motorbikes. My tin friend, Jenny, gave me a couple. Jenny, you know, that drives the the bus. That's Jenny Phileas. Yay! My tin friend. Anyway, so she gave me a couple of these uh, old motorbikes, and now I'm always scrolling through eBay for them so I can turn them into dragons. 
And by the way, the Shut Up series is traveling to Corvallis, Oregon sometime next year. See, the problem with um, trucks and planes and motorbikes is actually the motor, right? They need an alternative way of getting around. So this truck you see on, in the, that was in the paper the other day, this truck is morphing into a dragon. See, no motor, hence quiet, and no gas, so they don't contribute to climate change. I've always liked dragons anyway. Maybe it's because of my distant hippie past. Now, this is a fa favorite dragon piece. See, it's one of the islands from the No One is an Island series. There's a village on top and a dragon upside down under it. The story is you might wade too far out into the water and fall off the edge. But under the island lives something friendly like a guardian that will catch you and put you back on top. This is what is meant by a social safety net. Oh, now who has a card that says more? Oh, oh. <laughs> scared me. <laughs> is this all you make? Don't you make anything else? <laughs> well, haven't you ever thought eating is a sculptural process? <laughs> That's why it's hard to give somebody a bite of your apple. They're going to mess up your design. And I have a friend in Oregon who donates her paintings to a food bank, so I send her some of my monoprints to give away too. She was worried for a minute that people wouldn't be able to afford to frame them and that would make them feel bad. But I told her framing is a racket invented just to make it harder for both artists and art buyers. Right? So we started the TLF, that's the Thumbtack Liberation Front. But I, I really like lino cuts because while it's a 2D result, it's a 3D process and it's portable. When I get on a plane, I put all the little carving blades in different pockets, then I reassemble it when we get into the air and start carving. Then the flight attendants say to me, how did you get that thing on this airplane? Which I know would get me into a lot more trouble if I weren't a supposedly harmless little old white lady. I really like doing backwards writing. In fact, I like the whole process so much that I once put six months into carving a whole big, long <laughs> block of it. And will you roll this up for me? I call this, what do I call this thing? No, I call it the end of the line of That's just his nickname. Maybe it's the view from inside. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, it's, there's a video of it that Anne did on my Vimeo site. Uh, oh, yes. So anyway, I, I also really like backwards writing. In fact, I, yes, I said that. <laughs> so I do some drawing too. And for instance, this picture on the right, that's my dentist. She says she works on her own teeth, so I drew this picture for her. <laughs> I have a few dramas about my teeth, don't we all? OK, here comes a video. Okay. This is where I live. It's morning again. I wake up because the phone is ringing. It's a wrong number. I check the weather. I look at the headlines. I organize the day's potential visitors. I bat some vitamins down my throat. I drink a glass of water. I play some solitaire. I watch birds a lot. I wish I could fly. Sometimes I dream I can fly like a dragon. I would like to fly away. I'm scared of my teeth. 
I don't think they like me very much. Sometimes they bite me. I would rather live in a house that liked me better. There are quite a lot of things I would like to do. I bet I could paddle a kayak. I bet I could ride a bike. I always wanted to dance. I don't think I ever will. One day I found my teeth crying. Why? Where are you going? I thought they hated me. Turns out they just hate biting me. Maybe I'm too careless. Accidents are bound to happen. I could wear a hard hat when crunchy stuff wants to visit. I could do more yoga to stay agile. It can be cozy in here when it's snowing out. The view can actually be pretty nice from here. I call up and order tickets to the ballet. I sing a lullaby. I brush my teeth. turned it into a book, too. The more books here, including acres of lino cuts and drawings. I write a lot, too. Now, the thing with the clothing labels, by the way, who's got a card that says scissors? Just one moment. The thing with the clothing labels started because they are so itchy. I'm always ripping them out of my t-shirts. And that really, that turns them into a found object with a certain bit of a kick. So who, the, well, yes, let's hear that. Where do you get the labels? Well, thank you for asking that. That's what these scissors are for on the table. Ta-da. And I also have envelopes. That's for you to take, for you to go home and take the labels off your clothes and mail them to me. They're really itchy anyway. You do not want them. <laughs> See, the medium isn't exactly all that important. And the idea or image that opened the door for me last week doesn't do it for me this week. The way in has to be invented and reinvented all the time because it's the creative process itself that opens the door, not the thing created or the words spoken. Who has the card that says money? But how have you been making a living all these years? The question is, how have I been making a living all these years? Well, well, thank you for asking that. Of course, all this time, I've been making all kinds of art, some of which is what you might call commercially viable, i.e. saleable. So I've managed to be self-supporting, self-employed since 1978, always by making something you could loosely call art. I did soft sculpture for years. Some of it became my bread and butter work while I was making ceramic and bronze in the other, or something in the other part of my life. I used to send a couple of hundred empty sewing needles to my mom in Toronto every week or two, and she would send them back threaded. I figured she threaded 70,000 needles for me. So I did a little bit too much of that. In retrospect, though, some kind of miracle that I never had to have an actual J-O-B. So I've exhibited and sold in 
galleries, jewelry shows, museums, shops, Pike Street Market, art festivals, retail, wholesale, online, offline. I've always run a, a one-person operation. As much as I didn't want to be an employee, I didn't want to be an employer either. Now, the tin took over where the bronze left off around 2006. Not any less time consuming, but nice to be able to work in my own studio. I've always worked in multiple mediums and pursued multiple marketing or exhibit venues. So at one time, I was making dolls and selling them wholesale, making mapified sculpture for art festivals and selling bronze in galleries. Uh, I'm a bit of a perpetual motion machine. Okay. So who has the card that says kind of? Aren't you getting kind of old for all this? <laughs> well, that's what my five-year-old neighbor, Riley, said to me once. She said, you're so old, but you're really a good artist. <laughs> but I am getting Social Security now, which I think of as my monthly art grant, so I can make what I want to now, saleable or not. I'm not done yet. As Lisa Edge said in Real Change, reviewing the old Dyke show at Coca a couple of years ago. And also the last couple of years, I've been doing a monthly email newsletter. You can sign up on my website if you were so inclined. As much as I drag my feet about updating my website, I love doing the newsletter, which not sure why, because what's the difference? Anyway, so who's got a card that says fairs? And it says, the art festivals were fun, though, weren't they? Huh. Wouldn't you think so? See, that last art festival I did was in La Quinta near Palm Springs in March of 2020, just before everything shut down due to COVID. If it had been just a couple of days later, the whole thing would have been canceled. Ugh. Anyway, first of all, there was so much snow, I barely managed to get out of my driveway. Then I went over to the coast route to avoid a 100 miles snow back up through Eugene, drove way around and up over a huge mudslide near Banning, and then Sonoma was underwater. But on a nice day, you think, gee, this life sure works. Now, in general, I get a lot of positive input. The people who can't relate just walk quietly past. And do you know what people say to me all the time in these exact words? I don't have a creative bone in my body. This culture does such a big disservice making people think that it is criminal. Really. So the people at the art fair talk to me about their problems. The badly behaved neighbor, the recently deceased parent, the annoying brother-in-law, the imperfect significant other. So besides the art therapy and business coaching, I do a lot of couples counseling and grief counseling too. <laughs> Sometimes there's time for a collaborative drawing with the fan base. But sometimes you wonder, who ever thought up outdoor art festivals? <laughs> this looks like a lot like the Salmon Days Fair I did in Issaquah one October. Oh, brother. Now, it, it doesn't rain much in La Quinta. It usually looks about like this. But they can get some terrible winds that break glass and knock down booths and shut down the fair. On the plus side, as far as making a living goes, there's quite a bit of scope for invention in a retail business, as long as I don't go too crazy. There are things people at art festivals can't stand. Dragons, yes. Snakes, no. Blue, yes. Green, no. Three arms, maybe. Three heads, no. Do not mess with the head. Plus, no blood and guts and no political commentary. Strange, isn't it? Because TV, right in your living room. Murder and mayhem at the news itself. Surprisingly, um, ad nauseum was kind of a hit. <laughs> now, who's got the card that says negative? How do you keep negative thoughts or comments from poisoning your art process? Now, that is a good question because, you know, that's really important. See, 
Art talent, like true love, supposedly arrives intact, instantly recognizable, happily ever after. But real love is not instant, and art is not a talent. Both are a life choice. So don't be shocked when you read the fine print and realize this thing needs regular maintenance. You have to nurture it with your best and kindest attention. No self-respecting life choice will put up with insults and snotty remarks and stinginess and sarcasm. Give it lots of space. Take it on long walks. Bring it cups of tea and nice snacks. Give it the best spot in the house. Make it feel loved. Uh, some artists claim to be striving for excellence. But I'm thinking, well, that would be way too scary for me. Plus, how would you even recognize it once you got there? I do, of course, notice the fluctuations in my confidence barometer. The belief, the doubt, the up talk, the down talk, all just noise. Since I seem to have a choice, I prefer to pay attention instead to the itty bitty, teeny weeny, nitty gritty, stop and go, push and flow, yes and no micro decisions of the art process. Would rather trust to the rhythm of helter skelter, hit and miss, work and mess, grimy, slimy, the more, the less. The chance fates of curiosity, luminosity, transformation, the upside down, the underneath, the over the top. Who has a card that says next? What are you working on next? <laughs> My favorite question. You remembered. Well, I'm doing more on the shut up. I'm making pretty good progress with this vacuum cleaner now, too. I'm covering it with all with beads and stuff. Used to be a pretty good vacuum cleaner, but I never vacuum because why? Too loud, right? Anyway, so it's now a found object. And I'm also working on more globes, but it's just about, it's not much farther along than this. And I'm also pretty interested in a potential vomit series. <laughs> featuring heads spewing out beautiful swirls of beads, rhinestones, toys, or maybe mapified or made of tin, themes of regret and purging, things coming in but going out the wrong way. Um, who has the card that says surmise? Don't you think you should be concentrating on perfecting your skills in one medium? No. Don't you think that some people are born with creative talents, but most people aren't? No. Art museums and art history are dominated by class-privileged white men. Don't you think this is because they make better art? No. Don't you think the sign of a real artist is consistent attention to one cohesive vision? No. Don't you want to make a significant contribution to art history? No. Well, then, what is art all about for you? Well, here's what I think. Art is, by its nature, free and equal. Even if the culture pretends that only some people can make art and bases this theory on class, race, and gender bias, no matter what ridiculous hoops you have to jump through to exhibit or sell your art, and when you peel back all the bias, all the commercial transactions, you can just know that art at its center is a free zone where no rules apply. And how utterly rude to cram hierarchy and judgment and exclusion on top of this creative energy, which, as we know, is some of the best, most healing, most rewarding energy in the universe. So if somebody is knocking at your front door, with a sales pitch about promoting your brand, you can just slam the door in their face and go right out your back door into the limitless, free wilderness of your imagination. And this is exactly what I'm trying to protect and promote and share. Thank you. <laughs> and by the way, there are some... There's some shut up lino cuts up here and some other stuff too. And don't forget the labels thing. I want those labels. <laughs> See, there's these, it's my shut up lino cut. I made copies and my glue list and a couple other things. Okay, that's it. I don't care. No, I start from scratch. I I'll recycle them. Help, how do I get out of this thing? Oh, questions. Wait, we have questions. I forgot. We have questions now. We can take copies of your linocuts. What? We can take copies 
of your lino cuts there? Exactly. Because I came one to one of your things, and I I didn't I didn't know. And well, I was nice. leaving, and I saw other people with them, and I said, "How come you got those? Did you have to buy them?" And then they said, "No, there's a table. There's a table full of that stuff." Yeah. And so, I I went over there and I took one of everything that was there, and I know there are more. And you can have as many as you want, Jean. Just, just you know, I make like, as you know, thousands. So your question. Where did you live? I live on Harstein Island, which is kind of down by Shelton. It's like, you know, it's a place where less than nothing happens. So it's. I don't think so. Yeah. Well. Yeah. There's a, there's a, you know, dearth of activity there. Yes, your question. I, I'm a good sleeper, but I'm a, I'm a perpetual motion machine, you know. I really am. People are always saying, Kathy, sit down. But no, just get used to it. And I, of course, I sleep in that tent that you saw. And sometimes on my back porch if I have a dog visiting. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, let's do something else. Thanks for coming.